All right, we're recording week two live session for color theory and attendance is Alicia, Katie, and Mark. Glad to have you guys. All right, let's just start out with any general questions about anything you've done so far and your feeling about the course. So far, so good. Great. Yes, Mark, I couldn't quite hear you. I don't, I don't have any, can you hear me now? All right, yes, a little better. All right, let's get into it. So week two, we're starting a whole new project. Oh, wait, Alicia. Uh, well, um, technically, she's asking, where were the silk screens meant to be finalized in color or black and white? Uh, for this assignment, I asked that they be in color because uh, you're really just sort of showing off your work. But if you are actually making silk screens, you would have to do them in black. So I probably won't take points off if you did them in black, but um, yeah, color. It's all right, Alicia. I think we'll give you a pass on that. It's confusing if you've ever been involved in actual silk screening, you're used to everything being in black. So I understand that. All right, let's talk about this next project. Uh, you're gonna do. You've, you're you're gonna get a creative brief on a fictional company and create a logo and color palette for this company. Uh, there's lots of components throughout the month. So first thing is you need to go to the Google Doc, uh, the the link, and sign up for a brand. Uh, I'm gonna jump out and show you what I'm talking about for those who have not. Has everyone in attendance actually signed up for their brand? I have. I was Katie. I was still looking through it. You're still trying to decide? A little bit, yes, sir. I understand. Um, don't wait too long. They go quick. Um, yeah, I'm doing it now. <laughs> all right. Uh, here's what it looks like when you go to the spreadsheet, you put your name in here. Um, oh, the, sorry, this is the archive. Incorrect. That's what used to be. Here it is. Uh, you put your name in where it says name. You click on this and you'll receive a, a Dropbox with some a file that you need in order to proceed. This is your creative brief, basically, for whatever company it is that you've signed up for. Um, they're all uh, packaged goods type things, products, soap, uh, coffee, tea, candy, uh, cookies. So they're all in that line. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, when you download this file, it might seem a little confusing at first. So you're going to read through the assignment carefully and understand what you're supposed to do. Back to my lecture. All right, so this is what this week looks like. This week, you're basically um, creating a logo. Um, and there's a, a couple of steps. This is my process that I want you to go through. So uh, here's the live session. You're going to sketch out an icon, a logo icon, um, and submit that for uh, <coughs> discussion <coughs> Excuse me, by Thursday. <clears throat> Uh, on Friday, uh, you should ha complete your logo sketches and then jump into the next part of it, which is the logo process and identity roughs. What you're really doing is you're creating 10 icon sketches and narrowing them down to three, which you're going to explore in the 5.0 assignment. It's kind of like I say, it's like the bachelor. So you do 10 sketches, three of them get the rose and get to go on a special date with Illustrator. So that's what you're doing. Hey, Curtis, glad you made it. So let's talk about logos. I know you've all probably done logos at some point in one of your classes so far. Uh, why do we have logos? What's the point? Any thoughts? It serves as an identification. 
Yeah, it's identifying a company. Uh, but why not just say the word, say the name? So it's something Katie's memorable? Right. Yes, Katie, you nailed it. Memorable. Yes, memorable and visual, right? A visual helps us yeah. uh, understand quicker. If you think about it, uh, this goes back to medieval times. Not a lot of people could read. And so a lot of people did uh, things with icons as sort of a business. So if you were looking to get your shoe fixed, you looked for the sign of the cobbler. You couldn't necessarily read it. Uh, in modern times, it becomes more of a speed thing. Like we want to see things quickly and get it uh, down right away. Um, if you look at, uh, this is a painting by uh, Copley. These old uniforms and the flag are basically color scheme and logo that bring people together uh, for a cause, whatever cause it is. Uh, in this case, it was the Battle of Jersey against the French. Um, but this goes back a long way. We identify things through color and through logo iconography and that's kind of like what brings us together tribally, which is our instinct. Uh, it goes back a long way. Here's Roman in Roman times. This is actually a painting by David. Do you see the logo in here? Yeah. Yeah, where is it? On the shield? Yes, on that shield right there, yeah. Uh, do you know what that is a picture of? A wolf or a bear? I'm not sure. Alicia says a lion. That's a good guess. Actually, it's a wolf. It is a wolf. Uh, oops, what's going on? <laughs> All right. So um, it's a wolf feeding two human children. Uh, it's the symbol of Rome, Romulus and Remus. Um, if you jump into the 20th century, <clears throat> Logos, uh, this is from a book called Learning from Las Vegas by Robert Venturi. And uh, he pointed out that logos are more important than the building. When you're driving down the road, you're hungry, you're looking for the golden arches. You're not looking for the building of McDonald's, right? Uh, right. In a more mobile society, logos become even more important. And as we move into the internet and going through things at the speed of light, logos are even more important. Here's a logo. Uh, this logo uh, evolved over the years, um, and I think it's come, it's sort of landed in a good place. I've had nothing to do with the design, by the way. So, uh, but it's a little weird, okay? So first of all, there's an icon and there's logo type. And together, we put those together and that's called a logo lockup. And this is what you're working this week toward. You're going to start off with the icon, add logo type, and create a lockup by the end of the week. Anybody know why the full sale logo is a plane? Anybody went on the behind the scenes tour or anything? Yes, Curtis, you think you know what it is? Um, yes, I, I heard the story before, so I, but um, it's, I, I would say part of it is that the plane is replacing another favorite icon that was um, possessed by another entity. Yes, it was a ship and uh, Disney owned it and they said you can't use the ship anymore. And so they put in a plane. The, the, what I heard is that one of the owners of the school had a plane and uh, they also thought it was kind of more high tech. Yeah, Mark says it was a boat. It was a flying galleon. It looked like Captain Hook's ship. And I think that's what really what it was supposed to be. And Disney said they own the rights to it and couldn't use it anymore. So they put a plane in. Um, they used to fly people down here to the school all the time too. So it kind of, the idea of full sail is sort of like hopping over obstacles, flying, like that's where the boat was in the air, but flying a plane is like surpassing obstacles that get you to your dream. Um, 
so if you were going to create a logo for the school today, you wouldn't use a plane, right? And you probably wouldn't even call it full sail. But this is what we got. And what it has, which Katie pointed out earlier, is it's memorable. It's weird. It's funky. And because it's different, it sort of works. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, so there are other kinds of logos besides this configuration here, but this configuration is what I want you to use. Like here's a couple of logos. They have what we, these are called word marks because there's no icon. There's just the word, right? These two companies are really old, like from the 19th century. And their logos represent the way people used to handwrite back in the 19th century. So it really is not very contemporary. Now, both these companies have lots of money to spend to make sure you remember them. And they have multiple brands within them, a complex brand structure and all that. But uh, this works for them because they've been doing it for a long time and they have a lot of money. But I don't want you to do a word mark. I want you to do like the full sale logo. So whenever you think about how should my logo be structured, look at the full sale logo and remember that. The icon actually helps if you think about it like apps on a phone. The little square or circle um, is a great device on the web and it works well. These are actually cupcakes, but they're kind of cute, right? Yeah. yeah, and effective icons are real eye-catching and they tell you what they are right away. So you see this little these little bumps and you know circles and somehow it's a taxi. It's a car, but it's got a little bump on the roof. So I know it's a taxi, end of story. Uh, that kind of simple, clear communication is very useful in today's modern use of logos. Here's a logo. This was the YMCA. The YMCA a few years ago did a study and they determined that no one calls it the YMCA, right? They all say the Y. So they changed the logo to reflect that. They also added, you see in here, there's sort of like a, a an arrow, like press start on the treadmill. Hmm. Right? It's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. It has simplicity and energy, and it communicates loudly and clearly. And I think that works. They added, of course, the YMCA here, so you're in totally clear. Now they created this sort of complex color palette, which doesn't work because it's too complicated. I talked to the people at the Y and they said uh, they didn't really get how to use the colors because like each one of these represents like physical fitness, community involvement, family values, some, I don't know, some stuff, but it's too <laughs> complex. So keep it simple. All right. Can you think of a logo that, uh, that does this, that is simple and communicates clearly and effectively? with an icon. Apple. Okay. Wait, who said All that? Who said <laughs> that? Everyone said Apple? Oh, it was I. Yes, Apple. Good guess. All right. What does an Apple have to do with computers? Or cell phones for that matter? Hmm. The answer is... Mailbox. And I don't know, <laughs> right? It doesn't right. really. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about Apple, the Apple, the company. Uh, when Steve Jobs started it back in the day, computers, personal computers, were highly complicated, difficult to use devices. You needed a huge <laughs> manual. When you turned it on, a blinking cursor came up. If you typed in exactly the right code, it would load the operating system. And if you typed in the wrong code, it would just beep and keep blinking. Um, so he said, uh, so only like really, it's like nerds and math geeks and scientists use personal computers. And the rest of us were like, eh, it's too difficult. So Steve Jobs had a vision that it can, personal computing could be for everybody, uh, that everyone would benefit from it, and he wanted to make it more accessible to everybody. So the first Macintosh computer, when you turned it on, it actually spelled out in beautiful 8-bit black and white letters, hello. 
said hello. It was like, wow, it's friendly. Um, and he was correct. It did change the world because everyone got into it. Um, so with that sort of idea of the company behind it, what is an, what do you have to do to eat an apple? Bite. Bite. Yeah. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to cook it. You don't have to peel it. You don't have to, you can do those things if you want, but if you just want to take a bite, you grab it and take a bite. Um, and that's the idea behind Apple computers, like grab it and take a bite, jump in, do what you want, take a picture, uh, design something. Uh, the whole thrust of the company is accessibility and universality, like apples are everywhere. Um, you see an apple and you recognize it. Uh, it also has some connection to knowledge, like from the Garden of Eden, from Isaac Newton having the apple fall on his head and discovering the laws of motion. So do you see now why an apple makes sense for the Apple computer company? Yes. Yeah, so uh, great uh, icons are more or less sort of a metaphor, a symbol for the brand, not the products. Can you think of another loco that uses an icon effectively? I'll help you out. How about Target? Why is Target's logo a Target? A Sunoco, <laughs> the winged horse. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's uh, so let's talk about uh, Target for a minute. Um, who's Target's main competitor? Walmart. Yeah, Walmart. Uh, now, uh, that's Katie, right? Katie, what's the difference between your experience going to Walmart versus going to Target? Uh, that was me, actually. Oh, Alicia. Who, okay, who, sorry. I don't shop at Walmart. I'm more of a Target shopper myself. And why is that? Um... I don't know. I think I trust it more, maybe. What's your know. experience when you go to Walmart? <laughs> What's it like? Um, it seems very casual and, I don't know, crowded and busy. Yes. And I think Target is a lot cleaner and um, organized, I guess. Yes, exactly. In fact, uh, more focused, right? They have more of the things you want. Lewis, Walmart has like virtually everything. Target has right. not everything, but probably more of the things you actually want. It's targeted. You see how that works? Okay. I'll tell you the background. Well, the background on Target is, you know, Walmart, Sam Walton, who founded Walmart, he figured out how to get things into the store cheaper than anybody else. And as a result, he was able to have lower prices in their stores than their competitors and they started opening up walmarts all over the country and as they did these other stores went out of business trying to compete on price and they were unable to uh caldors uh kmart um corvettes there's like dozens of them all over the country and when they came to minneapolis where davidson's department store was uh, the head of that department store said we're going to change the rules we're not going to compete on price we're going to compete on store experience we're going to make it nicer to go to target we're going to have more of the things people really really want and we're going to have the stores look neat and clean and be uh, easily accessible all those things sort of focused and targeted and they accomplished that and they managed to compete against walmart effectively and stay in business wow so your experience, as you described it, is a deliberate, it's by design, yeah. I love this quote by Einstein. He says, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler, which is kind of a joke because if it's been made as simple as possible, by definition, it would not be made simpler. <laughs> Thank you, Einstein. <laughs> He's a funny guy. All right. Um, when you look at targets, they're very branded. This red color is so dominant. It's everywhere. And you sort of get a warm feeling, right? When you see that, uh, you go into the store, the people, uh, the carts are the same red, the shirts are the same red. They're very careful about being consistent. 
And consistency is a hallmark of a, of a good brand because inconsistency makes us feel nervous and not willing to whip out our credit card, right? If you have a friend, mm -hmm. like if you think of a brand personality as a friend, it's like a person, right? If you had a friend who uh, is really inconsistent, like sometimes they're nice to you, sometimes they're mean, uh, they're late for lunch, uh, they forget your birthday. Um, after a while, you're like, you know, you're not such a great friend. I don't know what, I don't know what, yeah, I may love you, but I don't want to hang out with you. <laughs> and brands are the same way. Uh, the, uh, brands are not part of our family. They're, they're trying to do business. And it's like, if you're inconsistent, if I get an inconsistent experience, I'm not going to engage with that brand. And color is a huge part of that, as you can see with Target. So let's talk about some other logos. So here's some logos. This is NBC. What is their logo icon a picture of? The peacock. Yeah, why is it a peacock? What do you think it means? I honestly, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Well, years and years ago, uh, go ahead, Curtis. Uh, I'm sensing entertainment variety. Yeah, there's some variety. Uh, originally, they put a peacock on color TV to show all the color, but I think now it would represent diversity, variety, uh, different kind of programming, right? Uh, AT&T, what's that a picture of? Globe? Yeah, it's a globe and information sort of zooming around the globe, right? You know what AT&T stands for? American Telephone and Telegraph. It's actually Alexander Graham Bell's original company. Oh, wow. That's where it started. <clears throat> All right. Uh, metaphor, visual metaphors. Now, this th these are a bunch of logos, and, and some of them show some techniques you can use. Uh, this one, imaginary friend. What's going on there? It asks you to imagine the other person on the. System. Yeah, like it's a, it's a little bit of a, a called paradox. Like it's sort of a gentle paradox. It's like, wow, there's no one in there, but somehow she's going up. So it's kind of like what's not seen is what's important, right? Which is kind mm -hmm. of a twist. It makes you think. It make it makes it memorable. This one, paint the city. What do you see there? Two images, right? The drips and the city. Uh, now, negative space is your best friend when it comes to making a logo. And you can see that here. And I guarantee you that the way they came up with this is they were sketching out a paint can. And somebody looked at it and thought, you know what? That kind of looks like a cityscape. And they developed it further. And there you go. Uh, this one, farm to fork. It's kind of like a fork, but with these little animal creatures on there. A uh, maritime law is like taking an ordinary object and giving it a twist. So this has these boats instead of the just normal little trays that they have on the scales of justice. Or a bar uh, mug that's actually got a barcode in it. How about this one? Embassy landlines. Do you see the telephone? Mm -hmm. In the oh, negative yeah. space. Yeah. Negative space. Um, creating two images in one. This one, gym guide. It's a little dumbbell but it's also a GG. This, like, uh, I show this, but, I mean, using one of the, changing one of the letters into an image is, some people like that. I don't particularly find it useful when you start to build out your logo. It makes it hard to use the logo. Um, the icon logo type is, is a better setup for, um, everything you got to use it for. So if the company's called Rooster, you make a rooster and a star. Anyway, all right. So what do these companies do? What's this one do? Something about corkscrews, I'm guessing. Looks kind of like a corkscrew, right? Do you see a bottle of wine there too? Mm. Oh, yeah. oh, winery. Yeah. How about this one? Okay, motion pictures, uh, I see. This. Yeah, it looks like a film reel, yeah. How about this one? Well, 
electricity outlet. Yeah, it does look like an electrical plug. How about this one? Do you see two images here? I see a pen and a spoon. Yes, Mark. So what, what would that be? What do you think they do? Like dinner theater or something? Dinner theater, yeah. That might be a good guess. Uh, this one is like a button, but like with the letter F. Uh, this one we've all seen. See, Curtis, you haven't changed the battery in that smoke detector in a whole month. <laughs> and we're hearing it. Anyway. Uh, oh. World Wildlife Fund. Uh, this, the, again, negative space. You see how the negative space becomes part of the image? It's a great way to yeah. work. How about this one? What is this? What do they do? Home repair. Yeah, home repair. One image tells the whole story. And this one, you probably won't get, but it's actually called The Mill. And it's a sound stage, sound studio in a... Um, mill in an old factory so it kind of looks like an old factory but at the same time sound bars going up this is mm. sanctus spiritus wines horror film see how that works uh yeah and this it. the company's initials are ed but it also looks like a plug because it's an electrical yeah, that, mm. i think go mark the guild of food writers so they write about food yeah fashion center it's an <laughs> f uh, yeah, this one, they fix property, fix buildings, World Wildlife Fund. All right, I'm going to show you a logo I really like. All right, so what comes oh, to mind when you see that? Well, the glass half full. Yeah, the glass half full. That phrase comes into mind. It's not written there, but somehow your brain connects the dots and fills in the blanks. And I can tell you that when you get the viewer to do that, to fill in the blanks, to to say the punchline in their own head, you've made something memorable. That's a great way to work. All right, now I'm gonna show you a little bit of the work of Louise Feely, who is a designer in New York, and she does some different types of things with logo. She's a great designer who loves kind of this retro old world kind of, I would say pre-war, stuff she does a lot of restaurants this is a restaurant le monde and it looks like it's from a time gone by and it does what uh, i would call sparking your imagination this is another restaurant and it looks like it's from the 20s right mm -hmm. even though she's a contemporary person but piccoline a food product again it feels like it has a history it feels like it uh it sparks your imagination so this is a, a wine bar in New York City, the artisanal. Now, when you see this, do you, do you get anything come to mind? Like, what do you picture the place being like? Maybe some outdoor tables, right? Some good wine, a little bit of cheese. <laughs> You all are so busy I'm being students. Of, uh, what, Curtis? I'm thinking something like a Italian villa on countryside. It's got this countryside imagery. So you sort of think, well, the cheese comes from this beautiful upstate New York farm, and uh, the wine's probably great. And um, it spark, like I said, it sparks your imagination. This is another restaurant in New York called Marseille. And I, it, it sort of brings to mind, like, oh, they probably have an accordion playing and some white tablecloths and some good wine and some great food. It feels like something. I think that's one of the key things you want to do with logos. All right, so now I'm going to show you a video of Louise Feely, an interview with her, which is actually pretty good. Uh, message me if it's not coming through well. I, some, I have hit or miss on how videos play sometimes, so here we go. Louise Feely, New York City. 
I have a very narrow focus for my studio. It's the only three things I'm interested in, food, type, and all things Italian. New York is a city of specialists, and this is a place where you can have a studio totally devoted to book jacket design or food like I do, and I really don't think that would be possible anywhere else in the U.S. I've always had a small studio. I have two people working for me at any given time, a senior designer and a junior designer. And uh, when a new client comes in, I'll meet with them. I'll come up with the creative direction for the project. I'll do uh, a long series of sketches, and then I'll sit down with one of my designers and review it and then work with them closely until we have the final product. Working in Lubalin was an incredible experience. It was a place where there was such devotion to typography, it's something I had never been exposed to before. My office was in very close proximity to Herb, so I could really uh, witness his thought process firsthand, which was a great opportunity. For me, it was mesmerizing to watch Herb sketch out an idea. It was all in the sketch, and, and just watching him use either hand to, um, to work on his tracing pad to make an idea come alive. For me, that was and still is the most exciting part of design. It's, it's the sketch stage because that's really the soul of the design. When I started out, when I started my business, which was 25 years ago, it was a liability for a woman to start a business, especially to name it after herself. And in those days, believe it or not, we didn't have Google. And the only way to find somebody was in the telephone book, so I really had no choice. But I knew that there would be certain types of people who would take umbrage at, at the idea of a woman owning a studio. And that's particularly why I decided to name the studio what I did, because I really wanted to send a clear message, and that was, if you don't feel comfortable working with me, then I don't want you as a client. What I've tried to instill in all my staff, particularly the women, is that they can have their own business and they can succeed. And no, there was no one telling me that when I was that age. So I think it's very important to be a role model. All right, what do you guys think? What did you think of Louis Feely? I liked her. Yeah. She's uh, she's accomplished something in her career that is, you know, something we kind of all aspire to. Is she found something she really likes to do, and she managed to get people to pay her for that. So she has a kind of her own style, but that, but it works. It works for her. All right, a little more on logo. So keep it simple. Uh, Pentagram is another company that I'm a big fan of, which is a great design firm in New York. Uh, this is their 92nd Street Y logo, but here's some other logos by them, Walgreens. Uh, use black and white to keep it simple. Um, start off, it's like your hero portrait. You're starting off black and white and adding color in a deliberate, methodical process. You're going to create a lot of sketches to get to the 10 unique ideas that make up your uh, logo, that are there for your logo. These are all the same logo, like over and over. Try different things. Try a lot of stuff. Uh, work from pencil and paper and then get into the computer. That's the process. Um, okay, this is really relevant. Uh, this is what your sketches could look like. So this is a student example. This is Heather Ironman's. She had Mount Sappo soap, which is sort of a Greek soap. So you can see her sketches are not the best drawings in the world, um, but they're clear. You can tell what the idea is. So here's sort of a wreath with MS. Here's a winged horse. Here's some wings. This is like a Greek pattern with the initials. Here is a vase, a pillar, another winged horse. So this is really like the same idea, just two different takes on it. I want to see 10 unique ideas, separate ideas. So here's a different kind of combination mark. Uh, here's an ME with a different pattern around it, another a sort of wing, and this one with the pitcher. So she did 11. She had 11 ideas, but really one of them is kind of redundant. 
So redundant isn't good. You want to have unique ideas and try to push yourself to come up with some different things. Now, in the assignment, in the on FSO, you'll see this visual metaphor matrix exercise. This is not the assignment itself. This is a tool that you may or may not use to come up with ideas. And I'll just briefly explain it. What you're going to do is create a matrix. Yeah, get to it. A matrix with ideas that are sort of adjectives on one side and nouns across the other. And you try to draw a picture of the intersection of those things. Uh, if you do decide to do this, what you would do is try to do the easiest ones first and then extract whatever you like out of this and put that into your assignment for your 10 logos. But you don't have to use this. There are other ways to come up with logos. You can do a word mark, a word tree, you know. Um, you can do visual exploration, and I encourage you to do that. Draw a lot of things related to your product. Look at them like that paint the city can. So you're going to draw something, look at it, and say, what does that look like? It's like uh, when you lay out in the grass and watch the clouds go by, and you say, what do I see? What do I? What's there? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I typically work it as a um, um, in a mind map sort of method. I yes. had never seen this before, so I'm I'm excited to try this. Yeah, mind map is good too. In fact, I'd encourage you to sort of do the mind map first, and then out of that, maybe pull some of those words to use in the matrix. Okay. So just to review, you're creating the icon first, black and white, a pencil sketch. You create ten of these in pencil, ten unique ideas in pencil sketch, and then. You're going to add logo type and create three different lockups that you're going to explore to uh, pick the final one that you like the best by the end of the week, by Sunday. Um, I here so design is thinking made visible. So who said that? Fifty points for Hufflepuff, if anybody knows. <laughs> Saul Bass. Have, have you heard of Saul Bass? Yes. Yeah, he was a great 20th century designer. He really sort of reinvented the way movie posters looked. Uh, this is from 1960, 61. Uh, most movie posters were very sort of three-dimensional, airbrushy uh, stuff. And he created this sort of modern art look with more collage and flat imagery. Um, before there was motion graphics, he was doing motion graphics. This is a still from the title sequence of uh, North by Northwest, which was an Alfred Hitchcock movie. And doing it in a sort of three-dimensional way, going in space like this, that was really difficult to do back then. There were no computers. so um, But he really kind of reinvented it. And I can always tell when he did the movie titles. They're very dramatic. Uh, like I said, a lot of fine art, collage, printing that kind of thing. This look with like swatches of color and then black and white images over it, it's like hot today. Like he was very advanced. And among other things, he did a lot of logos. And uh, these are all some of the great companies, uh, Rockwell International, uh, Warner Brothers, Lowry Spices, the Girl Scouts, Pan Am, uh, AT&T, Bell Systems, ADP, United. So uh, he, was, he was the rock star of logos in the mid-20th century, second half of the 20th century. Um, there is a video. I'm not going to show the video now in my lecture, but it's a video on the assignment that is Saul Bass's pitch to the Bell Telephone Company to switch to this logo. And it's kind of interesting. It's about, I think, 12 minutes long. So it's worth watching just to see how he explains uh, how a logo works and what makes it um, what makes us humans see it a certain way um, and so I encourage you to watch that and see it I have it here but I'm not going to play it what should the bell do? it's from 1969 so it's pretty old but all the principles he talks about in it are relevant um, here <clears throat> I'm going to show you some other Great logo designers. Charles Anderson Company, they're out of Minneapolis, and they do some really terrific logos. You can see they do a lot of work for Nike. 
Uh, this is for Nike. You see the swish built in there. Um, and they really are masters at using negative space. You see the Warner Brothers frog. And uh, it's great use of black and white. Now, this is how they show their logos on their website, all in black and white. Um, they did stuff for Turner Classic Movies. And you can see how these kind of complex characters become these iconic figures, the gangster, King Kong, and the sophisticate and the queen. And it just gives you this kind of fun flavor of the movies, the old movies. This logo they did, Charles Anderson did for a company called Custom Inc. And they're a screen printer. And so here's the logo. What do you see in that logo? Um, an octopus and or, or a squid and then the ink droplets. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's an octopus and then the ink droplets. Now, the octopus is really just negative space, right? Just great use of negative space. And I want to point out this character, they call him Inky. Inky the octopus. Inky has a lot of personality, right? Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. And all that is accomplished with these simple shapes. There's no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no teeth, no lips. Just these few simple shapes, and you get a lot of personality, a lot of fun. And you look at it here, how they broke it down. It's like, you don't have to be a great artist you don't have to draw like leonardo da vinci you could use the shape building tools in illustrator and build this yourself if you wanted to see how that works all right this was a project uh by michael beirut at um at pentagram and this was what they were given this was the existing logo for saint petersburg clearwater over here in florida uh, they need to redesign this logo and uh, in a better way. Uh, some of the issues with this is it's a little complex. There's detail that is kind of fussy and doesn't really work well. The name is long too, right? So here's what they did. This is the icon. What do you see in this icon? I see the letters. Yeah. Yeah, there they are, SPC. And uh, oops, and it also looks like the wind and waves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he added the type, and you see here, he put it in a ring around the icon, and it's very legible and clear, but the problem with this is that the logo has to be quite large in order to be able to read it. And that doesn't always work. You can't always have the logo be really large. Like on a business card, it has to be small. So he created a second lockup with the type off to the side. And that's better for use in small spaces. So I encourage you not to do this because there's less flexibility and it makes it a little more difficult. Now, in the case of Beirut, they're doing a very sophisticated brand identity program. So they could have two lockups and that's okay. Um, this, uh, you see how the icon becomes a focal point that draws your attention. Uh, if you look at it now, see here on the letterhead, it's quite large and it works. You can clear it, but on the business card, you have to use the one with the type off to the side and the icon becomes this playful thing on the back and in all different kinds of uses. It sort of carries the weight of different aspects of the destination, like nightlife and, you know, outdoor activity, citrus, I don't know, the beach. It's fun. It becomes a platform for fun. Here's another Beirut project. This was the Fort Worth Museum. Do you see the letters here? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what he's not, what he said about this was it was really a children's museum and it's supposed to be fun. So uh, they created this kind of fun icon that they could play around with. So it works on a banner. They had this idea of like fun hats. You can see how it works on a, a van here, it almost looks like puzzle pieces. Uh, it becomes an eye-catching icon, a focal point to draw your attention to the name, the brand. Uh, and it works quite well. 
Here's a piece by Lure Design here in Orlando. And uh, you can see how they're using this dynamic shape as sort of a focal point. And then you keep the type very legible. So the type does its job. It's almost like the icon is a little flag waving down your attention, and then you read it. Uh, here's another one by Lure. This was for a beaded jewelry company. They do beaded jewelry for charity. And the icon looks like a piece of beaded jewelry. And then the type is very legible, but it kind of has a little curvy feeling that matches the icon. Uh, here's another one, Paxia. Again, a kind of interesting, fun, it looks like a Mexican tile, simple type, and uh, it's for a Mexican restaurant. This company's called 3B. Here's their logo. I love their logo. 3B. Um, and here's Dixon's Apple Orchard. What do you see in the icon? Is that a bear? Yeah, there's like a bear. It's the tr functioning as the trunk of the tree, right? Mm -hmm. So it has that little surprise. It's kind of fun. And they pulled out one of the leaves and used it as punctuation. The type has a relationship to the icon style, the green color, the inline uh, type, and it also relates. Uh, they got this other one, Skazgard. It's a construction company. So the icon is very powerful and bold, and the type has to match up with that. If it's like a script type, it wouldn't make sense. So as you think about your type with your icon, you're thinking what matches, what m m works with it. Like in this case, latitudes is kind of at an angle, right? So the type's at an angle. It goes together. Uh, this is the work of Von Glitzka, who is a great designer on, uh, he's, he's got a bunch of courses on Linda, and I recommend if you have time to watch any of his courses, they're helpful for this class and for others. So, um, Look at this turtle. Negative space defines the different parts of the turtle. He, were, he could easily work in black and white, right? And he looks happy and fun. Uh, he's got a lot of personality. Again, no lips, no eyelashes, no eyebrows, no pupil. But somehow it, it gets a lot of message across. And this is for seaweed snacks. Yum. That makes you hungry, right? Uh, another piece by Von Glitzka. This is uh, Tommy Knockers is a beer. Now, the type here is quite complex, and he is a master at hand lettering. So this is part of his lettering thing, and it has a distinctive kind of look. Um, somebody's eating seaweed snacks right now. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to point out this Tommy Minar this um, miner that he's got here. He The way he works is he sketches this out, a tight sketch in pencil, scans it in, and then pen tools out half of the head and flips it. So it's symmetrical, and then he bends little pieces of it to make it asymmetrical, to give it a little flare. But it saves some work, actually, when you do it that way. You can see how that works on a shirt. It's a cool shirt, but the beer is maple nut brown ale. Sounds disgusting. It's made from maple syrup. Ugh. <laughs> anyway, uh, what do you see here? Snake a snake in a bottle. bottle. A snake in a bottle. Yeah, the negative space again is your best friend. Uh, it's called the naked grape. What comes to mind when you oh, see like the that. naked grape and that snake? The, the fruit of knowledge. The... Yes, Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it doesn't Seems say like that very... anywhere, but it makes you complete the joke, kind of like the, the um, glass half full, right? Well, and a, a sophisticated wine. That's yes. the kind of thing that I get. And maybe a little hedonistic or indulgent, you know? This is kind of the Adam and Eve story. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, here's big ass fans. <laughs> so they come to you. They say their name is big ass fans. What do you got to do? You got to do a donkey, but not just from the side. You got to do it from the back. 
again, the negative space divi divides the head from the body and the tail from the back. There's a little bit of personality here. Um, it's all contained in a nice little shield. And this setup is just what I'm talking about, like an icon at the top that's either square or round, and logo type. It's, it's quite effective. And what do they make? They make fans, really <laughs> big fans. Yeah. Um, so, once again, a little review. Sketch away. You're going to get your creative brief from the Google site. Uh, read it carefully and start your ideation process of either doing a um, a word map or the matrix or visual sketching or whatever it is you do for inspiration to come up with 10 unique ideas that you're going to post to the discussion board. You're going to get some peer feedback and provide some peer feedback and then you're going to jump into the next step which is this 5.0 assignment, which is taking your best three sketches and bringing them into Illustrator. Now, there are videos that explain how to do each of these things. Uh, actually, there's a video on the 5.0 assignment that will take you through exactly how to do it, and I encourage you to, to watch that. I'll show you what the whole project looks like when it's completed now. This is a student sample. So this is Chase's. He also had Mount Sapo Soap. Um, that's his logo. He changed, he used the presentation template that we provided, which is an InDesign document, which you will get from the from FSO. Um, and it has all these pages. He altered it to ma match his brand, which is what I want you to do. Uh, you're being assigned a Pantone color, and you're going to read through Creative Brief. You have 10 words that you're going to use and create sort of a word, pay, a word cloud here. Um, you're going to explore target audience. So you're going to figure out who your target audience is and create these personas based on that. Uh, inspiration. This page is essentially like your little Pinterest board where you're going to put things that are you're either using as reference or inspiration for the project. You're going to pick out some fonts, two kinds of fonts, two flavors. Uh, display fonts, which have a lot more personality. Um, and are more uh, like logo type and things like that. And then info level, which is like ingredients, directions, things that you really want people to read. Uh, and then your sketches. Now, Chase scanned this. You can see it's kind of dark and hard to see a little bit. I wish it were brighter. Uh, they're kind of okay ideas. They're, they're really sort of a visual exploration. I wish it wasn't on grid paper. So, um, but he had some interesting thoughts, so we came to a conclusion, and then this is like the 5.0 assignment. So he did a, 10 versions of each of the three ideas in Illustrator, and then took them into the, another template that we're providing, which is called the Logo Rough. And what this does is test out your logo. Can you read it? Can you tell what it is in a letterhead, in a business card? You're not designing this fully. You're really just sort of putting your logo in. And you can do it in black and white. I know this is showing color, but you can do black and white here. Uh, and then one, two, three, and then you pick the winner, and that becomes your logo. So I know I've given you a lot, and as you go through the videos that are associated with the assignment, a lot of it will become clearer. Do you have any questions at this moment? No, I don't think so. No. Alicia's no, good. Sir. Curtis is good. Mark's good. Katie, you good? Yeah, I think so. Just one quick question. Yes. Um, is it okay to use a tablet and like sketch in Photoshop rather than on paper or Yeah. Okay. That's okay. I don't what I don't want you to do is start I, I want to keep it loose and rough at first. Right. And right. you get nailed down, and then you're going in and getting tight in Illustrator. Okay. All right, guys. I know you got plenty to do. Uh, we're going to end like five minutes early, which is not really early. Um, good luck, and I can't wait to see what you guys do. Now, remember, on Wednesday, I will do the midweek critique of anything that you've got so far.
anything you want to talk about, anything you want to bring up. Uh, also, I encourage everybody to go to and join Slack. No one's joined my group. I feel very sad. Uh, but if you join that group, I you did? Oh, good. All right. Yeah. And I posted it, but nobody said anything, so I deleted it. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, don't do that. Um, keep going. This is a I didn't think anyone was looking at it. This is the first month I'm using Slack. I know Amy uses it in the Photoshop class. Uh, we're trying to incorporate it more and more. I get on there as often as I can possibly think of. So if you're running into any sort of like technical trouble or snag and look for me there, you might get a quick answer that solves your problem and you get moving on rather than waiting for me to respond to an email. Sounds good. All right. Yeah, I'll join. Yes, Curtis, what were you going to say? Yeah. Uh, yes, I look forward to joining. All right. Great. All right. I'm going to end the presentation.